watch it's real talk man it's real talk with your main chip washington when it comes to information the man got an arsenal bring you up to speed with what you need he's a local and nationwide news feed let's talk about it dialect to do something about it chip got the flow wide open if you got questions about it man it's the show that brings you to your raw to solve all problems it starts with real talk it's 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 real talk yeah welcome to real talk And here we go, here we go. On this Monday evening, it is April the 3rd, 2023, 6 o'clock straight up. And of course, when that happens, you are in the midst of Real Talk Memphis. I am your humble host, Chip Washington. Very happy to have you with us this evening. Very happy to be here myself. Uh, it was a beautiful day in the city today. Uh, to understand temperatures are going to feel more like summer tomorrow. Uh, then they are spring with temperatures in the upper 80s for sure uh, in advance of another rainy event that we have coming in on wednesday but first things first uh i hope y'all had a great weekend uh this is holy week uh, easter is coming up uh, this uh, coming sunday so uh uh you know we hope you plan accordingly in, in terms of all of that friday is good friday so a lot of folks are actually off work on good friday uh as we head into the uh, the holy weekend uh, we hope to have a good show for you tonight. You know, that is always my hope each and every uh, Monday night when we gather at the river right around this time. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, how do you get this fine piece of radio broadcasting? Well, we are on 91.7 on your FM dial right now. That would be WYXR. Uh, you can also catch us on the uh, WYXR app uh, as well as tune in. Uh, we are on Facebook Live this evening and when the show post tomorrow afternoon, uh, we will be available on uh, YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. That's because we're actually a podcast as well. So now that we got all that business out of the way, great. As far as uh, the show tonight, uh, we're going to have a very informational uh, show this evening. Uh, we, we, we do that a lot, but tonight we're going to talk to some folks uh, that uh, none of which I've ever spoken with before. These are all brand new a guest, although uh, I'm getting to know them a bit. Uh, many of us are uh, more than familiar with the uh, protest uh, th that happened, that occurred in our city uh, at the death of Tyree Nichols uh, by several of our young uh, community activists out there. Uh, there is one in particular uh, who uh, stood out from the crowd. Uh, she was the leader. She was the organizer. Uh, and uh, she is uh, very determined to make uh, sure that uh, uh, things change uh, for the safety of our citizens, especially uh, as relates to the police department. Uh, and you never really hear them have uh, much of a conversation outside of what they do uh, when they are protesting various uh, issues and concerns. Amber Sherman uh, is supposed to uh, join me in a, a few minutes. She is a community activist and she is a, a protester. And again, right out front, uh, especially after the Tyree Dickel's death, uh, uh, she was on national television as well. Uh, she got a mention from uh, Reverend Al Sharpton uh, in terms of, uh, you know, being a protester that really make a difference and set the standard for what that should look like uh, across this country. Uh, the Wells family, the parents of Tyree Nichols, did not want any violence uh, whatsoever uh, to break out and sue, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the loss of their son. Uh, Memphis was the model for that. These, these young people got out in the streets and now they are in the face of the city hall of uh, folks, uh, our, our council men and women, uh, demanding change and uh, accountability for police actions. We'll talk with uh, Amber in just a few minutes. Also uh, joining me is Kelly Price. Uh, Kelly is a youth advocate. 
Uh, he is uh, someone who is dedicated to the betterment of our young people. Uh, he has a STEM program, uh, which of course really is the wave of the future educationally for our youngsters and a, and a, and a good way for them to get out from where they are now. And he's also uh, teaching them how to be young entrepreneurs. And he's got some other programs as well. Uh, and I thought that, uh, uh, you know, it would be good to have him on the show to talk about uh, his passion uh, for these young folks and why he does what he does uh, on a daily basis. And um, it's only been a week now uh, since the uh, tragic, or two weeks, uh, inside two weeks since the tragic events of uh, what happened in Nashville uh, at the uh, Presbyterian uh, elementary school uh, where a horrible shooting took place. We had um, six people die, uh, three adults and three children. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been wondering to myself, you know, how now that the funerals have started, how are these folks uh, being able to to grieve? I mean, how do you mourn a situation? How do you grieve a situation? How do you how do you digest all of that as you're you know, as you're, you know, uh, especially if you're a child, this is an elementary school. Uh, there is major trauma associated with all of this, not only with the children, but with the families as well. And, and because of that, I wanted to have uh, a licensed counselor on. His name is Charles Winton, and he will be joining us uh, a bit later on as well to talk about how to cope with uh, very traumatic events like the one we saw in Nashville. All of that coming up a little bit later. But right now it is time to celebrate you Celebrate your current trip around the sun. If you're celebrating a birthday, if you had one uh, over the weekend, or if you had one uh, today, or even this week, this is your time. This is the time we shout you out. And uh, I can't do that uh, until I say, hit it, Brent. Happy, Happy birthday is going out to the following on this Monday, April 3rd. Happy birthday, Sherry Steppens, today. Terry Lynn Robinson is celebrating a birthday, as is my old buddy Jamie Horton from Jackson, Mississippi. He is celebrating his birthday today. Happy birthday to Mr. Willie Hollinger, Miss April Draper, Dan Lewis Arada, and another friend and former colleague of the old Fox 13 days, James Mott. The Mott man is celebrating his birthday today. Uh, as is Kimmy Cool Jameson, Salisa Marmon, and Stacy Richards. Uh, my crew has all finally all assembled here. Ladies, do you have uh, any birthdays to share? You know what? No birthdays on uh, from the crew on this uh, Monday, but from all of us to all of you, congratulations. I hope your day has been filled with fun and laughter, and we look forward to being with you next year to celebrate your next trip around the sun. Thank you, Brian. So Friday uh, was a really bad day uh, because we had tornadoes roll through uh, this area. Uh, Arkansas, of course, uh, suffered some uh, tremendous damage. Um, Little Rock suffered some uh, fairly extensive damage, uh, but especially Wynn. Wynn is a town of 8,000 plus people. Uh, and I mean, it was completely wiped out. I mean, there's really nothing left uh, in terms of that. A lot of other small communities as well. Uh, here in Tennessee, uh, McNary County, uh, nine people uh, perished uh, as a result of uh, these uh, tornadoes that blew through that area in McNary County. Uh, Covington, uh, many of you may have heard, suffered some extensive damage as well. Uh, it's going to take time to rebuild, you know, all of these uh, communities. Uh, and, you know, and I think 15 people uh, total in the state of Tennessee uh, lost their lives. I think a total of 30 between here and uh, up to the Northeast lost lives uh, in terms of uh, those tornadoes. So please uh, pray for all of those folks uh, for their recovery uh, and also uh, for the souls of the lives that were lost in an EF3 uh, tornado, which is uh, winds at 165 miles an hour uh, sustained. Uh, really bad situation. We're supposed to be seeing some more severe weather possibly on Wednesday, uh, especially in the Arkansas area. So again, uh, we'll keep a close eye on that, and we're absolutely prayers up for all those uh, affected. So uh, a suspect was arrested in a reference to the mass shooting uh, at the Privé restaurant uh, last week that left two people dead. Um, he is uh, Devon Sykes. Uh, he's charged with uh, first-degree murder 
and a host of uh, a lot of other charges uh, in relationship uh, to uh, that uh, shooting, uh, which uh, started, uh, basically there was a disagreement uh, inside the restaurant uh, that led outside the restaurant, and that is uh, when the guns start coming out and people started firing. There was a big protest today in Nashville. Uh, we spoke a minute ago about the uh, shooting event that happened at the uh, elementary school there. Uh, well, on this day, uh, it was a group called March for Our Lives. Uh, they held a protest today, and their protest was uh, uh, all kids, faculty, staff, and students out of school uh, at 10.15 this morning, which is what happened with the time of when the incident happened at the school. Uh, and they marched from the school uh, to the Capitol, uh, and there were, there were hundreds and hundreds of them if you hadn't seen them. Uh, they uh, wanted the, uh, the, the members of the House to change the gun laws that are existing today. Well, I don't know how they're going to do that. They want to change uh, permitless carry from 21 down to 18. Uh, but anyway, these folks are serious. We need, we need some support here, and we need changes uh, in, in our gun laws for sure. Many of you heard that the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, uh, is in New York ahead of his formal arraignment tomorrow. Criminal charges have been filed against him. He has been indicted. He is the first president, ex-president in the history of this country ever to be criminally indicted. We will find out what the charges are. There are some 30 plus uh, tomorrow as he turns himself in about 2.15 in the afternoon. I'm also to, to, to be told that uh, he's going to, of course, have a little speech about all this uh, after he's rained, released, gets on his jet and flies back uh, to Florida. And finally, congratulations to the LSU uh, women's basketball team for winning their first NCAA uh, women's basketball championship. They played Iowa and they dusted them right off the floor. Now, this is the first time uh, that any team uh, representing uh, LSU has won a national championship. The ladies did it last night. Congratulations to them. The men will be in action in a couple of hours this evening. Uh, UConn versus San Diego State University. So we're going to take our first break. And when we come back, we're going to start our conversation for a beautiful Monday evening. This is Real Talk Memphis. I am Chip, and we will be right back. If you like Real Talk, here's a way you can get involved. Do you have a show topic idea or suggestion? Want to be considered a guest or have a guest idea? Then send Chip a message on his Real Talk show page and you can be a part of the Real Talk experience. So as he always says, go out and tell somebody. We'll be right back. WYXR is supported by the Orpheum Theater Group, presenting Story Fest April 13th and 14th at the Halloran Center. This two-day festival showcases the voices of Memphians. An intergenerational group of participants from across the city have collaborated with the Orpheum to share their stories in their own words. More information at orpheum-memphis.com. WYXR is supported by the On Stage at the Halloran Center 2022-2023 season, which continues in downtown Memphis. Experience live entertainment with music, magic, and more, including the return of Orchestra Unplugged and the Songwriter Series events. More information and the full lineup at orpheum-memphis.com slash onstage. This is Clarkport Keys with Crosstown Brewing Company. WYXR is supported by Crosstown Brewing Company's CBC Classic Golf Tournament on Saturday, April 1st at the Links at Galloway. A portion of the proceeds will benefit WYXR. More information available at crosstownbeer.com. Hello, Memphis. Urban Earth is a proud supporter of WYXR 91.7 FM. On Saturday, April 29th, Urban Earth is hosting our annual Flickr Fest, which will feature live music by Jeff Hewlett and Devil Train. We'll also have multiple food trucks, beer from Crosstown Brewery, and activities for kids and adults alike. The festival will be held at 80 Flicker Street under the Union Avenue Viaduct in Midtown. More information at UrbanEarthMemphis.com.
Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. And welcome back to Real Talk Memphis on this Monday evening. Very happy to have you with us. I see a lot of you have already checked in on the Facebook Live line. I appreciate you all as well. We'll do a roll call a bit later on. So as we talked about at the top of the show, uh, the Tyree Nichols uh, murder uh, shook all of us uh, to our core as a city and as a community. Uh, And one of the things that came from that uh, was uh, a lot of our community activists and organizers who are out here uh, protesting and demanding change and police accountability. One of those uh, folks uh, joins me now. Uh, her name is Amber Sherman, and Amber has uh, been uh, really in the spot. She's been in the forefront of a lot of uh, of a lot of the protests that, that we have seen and uh, uh, holding uh, the law the law. Uh, holding the lawmakers accountable, as I was trying to say, uh, for what happened with Tyree, looking for police accountability. And we have been praised as a city, uh, and they have been praised uh, because of how they have demonstrated uh, strength without using violence. So uh, without further ado, uh, please welcome to the show Amber Sherman. Amber, it's good to see you tonight. Thanks for coming on the show. You're welcome, Chip. So, uh, you know, as, 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 as I was talking, you know, we, you all, uh, and, and, and you've gotten uh, some national notoriety. You were uh, interviewed by some national news outlets when all of them were here uh, after this tragic event. Uh, Reverend Al Sharpton even mentioned you, uh, you know, and thanked you all, uh, you know, for, for, for doing the job that you have been doing to keep this movement going. Uh, you're very, very passionate about all of this. Uh, tell me where that all stems from in terms of you being passionate yes oh i mean i think it's uh it's a part of us as, as black folks to fight for the liberation that we deserve um and it looks like standing up when you see something is wrong um and calling people out on doing the right thing and getting reforms in place whatever it looks like i feel like it's our duty as black people to make that happen were you <laughs> were you surprised i think a lot of people were surprised maybe you weren't uh, but in terms of the uh, the community activists and and the, and, and everybody uh, getting together and unifying uh, as a unifying group, uh, we saw a rainbow here. This wasn't just black. This wasn't just white. This was just everyone, just men, women, everybody in between. Uh, were you surprised to, to to see that and and the number of people that were involved in this or no? No, not really. Um, I think that we've seen several times when there have been uprisings here due to police brutality or other forms of injustice that folks have from all walks of life from different communities and neighborhoods have come together to advocate. Yeah, it, it, it really seems, and, and I've been at, uh, now I know one of the things that you all have been advocating, and you were very serious about it in your intent, was creating ordinances that would hold police accountable uh, in various uh, ways. And if, if you will kind of walk us through a little bit about all of that, what you all were looking for, uh, some of the ordinances that have already been passed and another ordinance that you are looking for some uh, resolve to uh, next Tuesday. Yeah, so um, we had several ordinances that we introduced into the city council or, or um, drafts of ordinances that we mailed, like emailed to council members and county commissioners. Mm-hmm. Um, that would address each of the different demands that we had when we talked with Tyree's family and different community members on what they wanted to see um, changed here. And so that included ending pretextual stops, removing police from traffic enforcement, um, banning the use of unmarked cars and playing close officers within traffic enforcement, um, ending the use of the different task force and specialized units here that uh, one which was used to kill Tyree. Um, And then also establishing a data transparency um, dashboard where folks could go and see when someone is stopped, what they're being stopped for, um, where the stop occurred, if there was any use of force, why the person was stopped in the first place, because currently there is no reporting measures mm. here it's at all for traffic enforcement, for traffic stops. So when folks are being stopped and they're saying like, hey, I'm being brutalized or I'm being terrorized or targeted, there's no way to prove that that's happening because they don't track it in any way. 
Um, and then it, unless you're given a citation, there really is no way to track that you even had that interaction with a police officer because also we know that um, one, they don't track it and two, they turn their body cameras off consistently. So it makes it really hard to, and difficult for us to even track that those things are happening to folks. Mm -hmm. The data transparency ordinance did pass. Um, so that's now a law and they're establishing that dashboard currently. And then there was an ordinance introduced to remove uh, unmarked cars from traffic enforcement, but there wasn't one introduced that included plain close officers, even though we did ask for an amendment to add that. Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't added. So the, the ordinance was voted on just for unmarked cars. Um, I do think that plain close officers also need to be banned because it's a part of the fear mongering and the fear taxes they create within citizens when they're pulling them over if they're in plain clothes. And also you just can't trust that that's a police officer just based off the different incidents folks have had. And then the most impactful ordinance, which is the pretextual stop ordinance, is called the Driving Equality Ordinance that um, Councilwoman Michael and Easter Thomas introduced. It's on the third reading right now, and it's supposed to be introduced at the April 11th meeting. Um, and so we're hoping that that'll be introduced and voted on for a third time to actually put an end to pretextual stops because that's exactly how Tyree was killed. Um, it's exactly how a majority of black citizens here are being targeted. So, um... Uh, you know, and having having said all that, and having put all that on, on, on the table in front of the city council, who said that they were going to take action, uh, there is uh, one ordinance uh, I believe that is going to happen next Tuesday that is supposed to combine uh, all of the uh, individual ordinances into one uh, ordinance, and that is something that uh, you all are are really not behind because you don't think it has any teeth. Am I correct in that? Yeah, so we as um, my community members, um, including Tyree Nichols' family, um, Mr. and Mrs. Ravon Wells, do not support the Tyree Nichols Justice and Policing Act. They put out a statement earlier in the week about that um, mm -hmm. when that the ordinance was coming up for a second reading. Mm -hmm. We all went to the council meeting and made statements about it. We don't support it because it doesn't include anything that would actually keep Tyree alive. It uh, copies and pastes different sections of traffic enforcement statutes from the MPD handbook basically codifying it into law, none of which would have saved Tyree's life. Um, and it doesn't include the ordinances that we passed. So it does include like a very vague phrase about unmarked cars, but doesn't include anything about pretextual stops or the data transparency ordinance. And when we talk to different council members, um, one, they don't even read the things that they're proposing because Chase Carlisle said, oh, he hadn't read it. So he didn't see that it wasn't in there. Um, and that he would, he would say something to someone about it being added. And then um, Martavis Jones, the chairman, commented after they voted and said that he texted his research assistant asking her to rectify it and add in those other ordinances. I think that they're liars mm. and that they um, like to push the idea of process instead of just being real with people and saying that they don't want to pass something mm. or they don't want to add things that we're asking for. Mm -hmm. um, because when they originally wrote that ordinance, it was told to us that they were asking the city attorney to write an ordinance that would include all of the ordinances that were passed right. and they repealed them as individual ordinances because they would be included in that ordinance. But as we see, they're not in there. So uh, next uh, Tuesday is the, the third reading of this, and it is uh, it is it gets down to it. Now, I will say uh, I've been to uh, a few of the city council meetings of late, uh, and uh, I, I I was at a couple of them when the room was absolutely packed. I, I don't know that I've ever seen a, a city council I mean, auditorium packed and there were people standing in the back. And this was when you all were trying to pass the initial uh, ordinances. I mean, there was really strength in numbers. Amber, and you could feel, uh, you could feel the tension in that room and you could feel uh, the anger, the frustration, and, and, and maybe, you know, what you were all expecting uh, that day. Did that surprise you to see that many people? I know you put the call out, come, be here, stand behind this, and support this. But, I mean, I mean, it was an amazing turnout. But it was also, uh, it was also uh, pretty emotional as well. Yeah, I wasn't surprised. Um, I think that one thing that we've seen here is that when folks want to see tangible change, they show up. And so that's why they've been continuing to show up at council meeting after council meeting. Um, we'll start going to county commission meetings as well because those ordinances are going to be going through the county commission also um, because people do want to see some kind of tangible change. And we're sick and tired of people uh, playing in our faces and saying they're going to do something, but it doesn't ever actually amount to anything. And I don't think it's fair to citizens to wait until someone is murdered to say we're going to change some laws or change some practices. We should be changing these proactively. So that's what this looks like. The uh, the police chief, uh, C.J. Davis, has been at the last uh, few meetings as as well. 
Uh, she has, uh, you know, they're, they're, her and her command staff were sitting over off to the side and, and basically listening and watching. And I know some of these ordinances they don't necessarily agree with. Have you had a chance, Amber, to speak with Chief Davis uh, about some of uh, the concerns that uh, you all have? Yeah, we had a meeting with her and the mayor a few weeks ago. Um, I think the the most important thing that we got from that conversation is that um, as much as she lies to the public in her statement, she also lies to people in private. Um, and she's made statements to city council about them not using unmarked cars for traffic enforcement. We saw them using unmarked cars when they murdered Tyree for a traffic stop. Um, she makes a lot of excuses and doesn't give direct answers. And when folks give her very clear solutions to problems, she placates and skirts around that and doesn't really do anything. And so the same empty statement that we've been getting from her is all that I'm expecting um, because nothing that she's done proactively has changed uh, the environment for folks in Memphis who are experiencing um, discriminatory policing. Uh, how much uh, does the support of uh, the Nichols family uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wells, as you mentioned earlier, you said they put out a statement, uh, you know, that they didn't support uh, some of the changes. But, but I mean, how much does that mean to you? And, and really, how much does that uh, does that add an extra layer of of really the importance of what you all are trying to get changed in, in our community by having the parents uh, of a man who was murdered by police officers uh, in support of what you're trying to do? I do think it's important to have the buy-in of the people who are most affected. So that includes, you know, the family member of someone who was murdered, but also folks who have experienced discriminatory policing, who have experienced being put over by the Scorpion unit and harassed and beaten. I think that's always important to have that buy-in and also have their um, suggestions on how, you know, what changes should be made. But I do think that it's important to note that Decarcerate Memphis was already working on those reforms mm-hmm. last year before Tyree was murdered. They actually presented to the city council about what it's like being a black person driving in Memphis and the different statistics around um, how discriminatory the practices were, especially around traffic citations and pre-sexual stops way before Tyree was murdered. Mm -hmm. So the council actually already had this information. They chose not to do anything because they like to do that. They like to to talk and put out really good PR notes and go on CNN and cry, but they don't actually do anything in the end. And we're seeing that play out now as they push these reforms further and further back. The pretextual stop ordinance should have been voted on last month, but they keep pushing it back and holding it for several meetings because we're seeing that now that the national attention is kind of waned off, they really aren't taking it as seriously. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it is important to have that buy-in, but also that we have been pushing this issue for quite a while and they chose not to do anything months ago. Amber Sherman, uh, she's a community activist and protester, and you hear the passion in her voice. Uh, Amber, I know that you are anxiously looking forward to uh, next to Tuesday's city council meeting. I did see where you put out a post that said, look, you, you know, everybody needs to come. The community needs to come. You need to come from, from outside of Memphis to support this. There is strength in numbers. And are you, are you, uh, are you fairly confident that uh, by the time the meeting uh, is concluded that uh, you will get the changes that you requested? I think that um, folks will show up, of course, to show support and that the city council should do the right thing and pass the ordinances. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, Amber Sherman. Uh, and, and again, it, it's the first time we have really heard a voice, uh, you know, uh, you know, on, on a platform like this to talk about some of the issues that are dealing with us. Amber, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show tonight. I really appreciate it. And best of luck. You're welcome. Thank you so much. So. As we go to break, you know, it is important to note that, uh, you know, what Amber and a lot of her friends and a lot of these groups and organizations, the Carcerate Memphis and so many, uh, are really fighting, uh, you know, uh, for, for, for the rights of all of us. And I think it behooves us to be uh, at least uh, informed about what is happening out here and what they are trying to do out here uh, for the betterment of our city and community. And we wish them nothing but the best of luck. We're going to take another break. And when we come back, uh, we're going to continue our conversation. We're going to shift gears and talk a little bit about uh, the tragedy in Nashville and how people uh, cope with such a tremendous uh, event, sad event uh, as that. This is Real Talk Memphis. I am Chip, and we will be right back. If you like Real Talk, here's a way you can get involved. Do you have a show topic idea or suggestion? Want to be considered a guest? 
or have a guest idea. Then send Chip a message on his Real Talk show page and you can be a part of the Real Talk experience. So as he always says, go out and tell somebody. We'll be right back. Hey, I'm Will from Crosstown Brewing Company. We support WYXR 91.7 FM. A favorite beer is just like a favorite song. We feel something new every time we encounter them. Cheers to playing the hits and tasting the notes. WYXR Stereo Sessions presented by Menfo are back and we're bringing the funk and the bump for this next installment. Featuring the underground rap pioneer, the legend Lady J, and her 1994 cult classic cassette, Glock in My Hand. Make sure to mark your calendars to be with us in the Memphis Listening Lab for this free event, April 12th at 6 p.m. And keep on listening to WYXR 91.7 FM for details on how to RSVP. WYXR is supported by Shell Days Music Festival, presented by Mentho, April 21st and 22nd at Overton Park Shell. Shell Days will feature two days of music with Trampled by Turtles, Southern Avenue, Leftover Salmon, Neil Francis, Paul Thorne, and Bailey Bigger. More information at menthopresents.com. At WIXR, we are committed to uplifting local organizations and businesses who are making an impact in Memphis. If you are looking for ways to spread the word about your business on air and want to support WIXR at the same time, email us at sponsorships at WIXR.org. Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. And welcome back to Real Talk Memphis on this beautiful Monday evening in the city. I am your humble host, Chip Washington, and it's good to be here. And it's good to have you here. And uh, as I alluded to at the beginning of the broadcast, uh, you know, many of uh, us, especially the folks, our are, are, are friends in Nashville, are still uh, reeling over the events that happened uh, now two weeks ago. Uh, funerals are starting to happen. There were a couple of funerals for the for the two for the two of the three babies that were killed, the nine year olds, uh, and uh, it, it, it's still the city's in a state of shock. And uh, you know, all of us are because uh, these uh, events keep happening. I have to understand that the shooter uh, shot 152 rounds, 152 times uh, in that building, and had planned a mass murder. Uh, event. So I, th- I got to thinking about the folks who are most affected by this, the children, the, 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 the parents, the community. So I wanted to bring on someone who can maybe kind of walk us through that. He is Charles Winton. Uh, he is a licensed counselor, and uh, we're very happy to have him on the show. Charles, it's good to see you, and thank you for accepting the invitation to come on Real Talk. I appreciate it. No problem. I'm glad, I'm glad to be here with you, Chip. So, you know, you know, again, you, you know, this is something I think that you deal with in, in various forms uh, in, in your capacity as a, as a, a licensed professional counselor. Uh, and really, in situations like this, uh, when we're dealing with children, uh, you know, who are not, you know, still trying to develop cognitively and emotionally, uh, when something like this happens, uh, when, a tr- when a classmate is, is, is brutally murdered, uh, you know, just for no reason, and you're in a place where it all happened, there's a trauma that sets in, is there not? And h- how do we begin to start to deal with that? You're absolutely right, Chip, uh, is that it is very important um, that after those type of in- events happen, it is very traumatic. And times past, we didn't take trauma as serious as we do now. Mm. And so it is important and it is vital even for our kids that therapy comes right after a traumatic situation. Because if we don't set the trauma and set that trauma right, I like to say if we don't set it right, it won't heal right. Mm -hmm. So that emotional pain, those emotional scars, if we don't set it right, 
then we're looking at years and years upon years of layers of trauma that can happen. So those things that the kids have experienced, it is very vital that we get them some help that they can talk it, process it, and then we can then get to some healing through it. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you don't think about things like that, uh, you know, especially, you know, we've seen these mass shootings on school campuses. Uh, they're becoming almost, you know, fairly irregular occurrence around here, unfortunately. But then you don't really think about, you know, these kids. This was an elementary school. So these are like, you know, like five years old to maybe 11 years old, you know, at most. And, and they're just developing and forming and, 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 and as, they, as they start to grow up. I saw one picture, Charles, uh, on the news that still sticks in my mind today. Of, of a little girl uh, who was up on the second floor where apparently a lot of this happened and she just had her hands on the window and she was crying. And I mean, the emotion that, that, that goes along with that is, is just hard to erase. And that's why, you know, I just wonder how, how we, you know, we, we even begin that process of, of trying to maybe, you know, say what you feel, say what you think of the loss of a classmate and some of the th- things that you all do in, in your profession in reference to that. Well, and you know, Chip, you brought up an a interesting story because we starting off talking about the direct trauma that the kids and those teachers and the many people who were actually directly involved. But then you also have the secondary trauma for people like you who just mentioned those pictures that you see. And secondary trauma is the visions, the pictures, the hearing the stories from those the, who've experienced trauma. And just like you mentioned, I want to make your listeners aware as well. You mentioned the picture of the little girl that's standing in the window. Yes. Those type of pictures are sketched and etched in your brain that you're going to always bring up. And those are important issues that we're trying to say that just because you were not involved in Nashville does not mean you were not affected. And the very fact that you gave voice to that image shows you that you don't have to necessarily be directly involved, but those images can rest and it pictures and it comes up. And that's what we call secondary trauma. So I don't want your listeners to think just because it happened in Nashville or Mm -hmm. happened in Texas that it doesn't affect us. It still leaves lasting images on us as well. Absolutely (laughs) that. And uh, the the well said, and and there's no question about it, you you think about uh, not only the parents uh, who lost, uh, you know, their, their, their very young children, but we lost, uh, you know, some very treasured uh, faculty members as well, all in their 60s, okay. all had big families. You know, you heard the backstories and everything. I mean, it's just, I don't, I, I don't even think, one of the words I like to use in situations like this is devastating. But, Charles, I have to be honest, it doesn't even seem like that, that's enough. I mean, for, for, uh, for the loss, the unnecessary loss, that that people and mm-hmm. the unexpected loss that people face uh, in situations right. like this, and you know, and and and, and how how do you, I mean, as, as as family members who lost a father or a grandfather or a mother or a wife or whomever, um, you know, to how do you even begin to have those conversations with folks? Well, first of all, I think that we 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 need to educate what trauma is because a lot of times. We don't really know the definition of trauma and trauma is a deep stressing event. And it's those things that people want you to get rid of or just get over it. Uh, And you wish you can get over it, but you can't because it's that deep distressing event that has happened. And so first of all, I think we need to define and educate that what you're experiencing is trauma. And I think if we could put it in a, in a, a way that people who've gone through these issues can understand, then they'll understand the emotion that's come behind it. But one of the reasons why they don't really understand the emotion because they don't realize what they went through was traumatic. Oh, so it wow. makes it hard to explain my emotions, my distance, my isolation. So I think number one is education. Mm-hmm. And number two, giving people a safe environment that we can talk like you just mentioned, how traumatic that vision was. Being open and being honest in a way that you can communicate what's going on with you. Yeah, this is, you know, this is one of those things, and that's why I thought it was just so important to really have those conversations because for those of us who were not directly impacted by this, 
uh, you know, we are affected by this. I know I am, and I know a lot of other people, you know, are as well. Uh, th- this is uh, this is a tough job, uh, and and so let me just ask you finally, if I, if I can, uh, you do this for a living. We know that you're a licensed counselor, uh, but you're also a human being, uh, and uh, you know you mm-hmm. have family members and friends and colleagues and things right. like that. How do you process uh, situations like this? Or do you compartmentalize it to another area of your of your brain when you're doing this job? But, but how do you? How does it affect you? Especially when you hear people who've gone through right. things like that. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Because beyond just a, a therapist, I am a trauma trained therapist. So like ninety percent of my work are dealing with trauma. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like to say I'm one of the, uh, the 911 responder for mental and emotional after such events. So I, a great deal of my work is dealing with people who've been raped, molested, a hard divorce, going through traumatic situations. Mm-hmm. So for me to be present with my clients, I have to make sure that I have a safe environment that I can uh, process the things, the memories, the images, the stories that I hear day in and day out. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I always do is try to check in with myself, check in with my emotions. And there are times I leave my office and I'm sitting at the red light and I'm crying. I I, I want to stay connected, but I also want to be true to my emotions. And I said, wow, that hurt. And I think for therapists who are in this job, if we think that we're disconnected, that's not good. Mm -hmm. We are humans, just like you said. Mm -hmm. And so what I do is allow my time, myself, the space and give me permission to feel the feeling. And that's one of the number one things I tell clients. Give yourself permission Mm -hmm. to feel the feeling. And that's how you process. Wow. Wow, that's uh, that's heavy stuff. Charles uh, Winton, ladies and gentlemen, he's a he's a licensed therapist and counselor. And uh, Charles, thank you for coming on tonight and and trying to walk us through, uh, you know, what is a very very difficult time and and, and something that uh, many of those folks up there will never forget. Really appreciate you taking the time and and, and laying it out for us. And uh, you're always welcome back on the show, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you for having me. Anytime you want me, I'm here. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate that. Uh, Thank you. Yes, sir. Charles Winton, ladies and gentlemen, uh, kind of uh, walking us through, you know, trauma is real. And the feelings that you feel behind situations like that are real. And you need to be able to address those some type of way in order to be able to move forward uh, from uh, tragic events uh, like the ones uh, that he described and especially what happened here recently up in Nashville. Thank him for that. We're going to take our final break. And when we come back, we are going to uh, talk to uh, uh, a gentleman who is very devoted to the young people in our community. This is Real Talk Memphis. I'm Chip. Don't go away. We'll be right back. If you like Real Talk, here's a way you can get involved. Do you have a show topic idea or suggestion? Want to be considered a guest or have a guest idea? Then send Chip a message on his Real Talk show page and you can be a part of the Real Talk experience. So as he always says, go out and tell somebody. We'll be right back. Do you want to place your company in front of Memphis cultural consumers and influencers? How about interacting with them in a meaningful way? WIXR's second annual stereo sessions at the Memphis Listening Lab is back. We are looking for sponsors to support WIXR's exploration of unsung albums from the musical history of Memphis. For more information, email us at sponsorships at WIXR.org. What's up, what's up? This is the legend Lady J, the first independent down south queen. I would like to invite you all to the Memphis Listening Lab on April the 12th at 6 p.m. That's right, that's right. Just pull up and make your plans to be in the building with yours truly as I share all my stories behind the first recorded album, Glock in My Hand, presented by MIFO. W-Y-H-R Stereo Sessions. R-S-V-P for the free event at stereosessions.wy See you there. Nami. Yeah. 
WYXR's Meeting in the Middle is the perfect place for aspiring musicians and music industry professionals to link up and chat. This year, we're focusing on sense of place, exploring the factors that have led Memphis artists to launch their careers in other cities, and all the trends that have been bringing musicians from across the globe to choose Memphis as their creative home. Be with us to join the conversation from 5 to 8 p.m. on April 4th at the University of Memphis's brand new Rudy E. Scheidt School of Music Building. More information at middle.wyxr.org. Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. Welcome back to the big broadcast on this Monday evening. Chip Washington here with you. Your host and uh, my next guest is uh, is a is a fella who uh, is very uh, involved uh, with our community uh, in terms of the programs and some of the things that he is involved in. He's very uh, involved uh, with our young people and the future success of our young people as well. Uh, and and, and I, I I kid him. You know, we go to the same gym, and I kid him. You know, if I ever get if I ever get like you know famous or something, you know, I'm hiring you as a bodyguard, man, and I'm paying you premium price, dude. I just want you to know that. <laughs> Welcome, Kelly Price, to the show. Welcome, Kelly. Hey, man, good to see you. <laughs> hey, what's going on? How you doing? Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you good, man. I got you good. Cool. Doing fine. Hey, hey, you already famous, so hey, we you just gotta get the money together. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a businessman right there, ladies and gentlemen. That paper <laughs> right, and we can talk about it. But uh, Kelly, it's great to see you, and it's great to have you on the show, uh, and and welcome in. And and the reason I wanted to have you is because you know I I I, I know that you're into a lot of things, and you're very community based, you know, as well. Uh, and one of the things that you talk about is the STEM program for our young people. You're also working with them about being uh, future entrepreneurs. These are very positive and focused uh, uh, things. What made you decide to 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 venture into these uh, areas in particular? Um, I tell you, it, it kind of started out just I wanted to teach my um, grandkids. We had them here for the summer, and I wanted to teach them how to make a lemonade stand. Uh, so I gathered up a bunch of other kids, uh, about ten of them, and I got them together one summer and just started teaching kids about entrepreneurship. And it kind of grew from there. And then someone said, "You ought to start doing this on Saturday during the school year." So we uh, developed the curriculum and started doing it uh, during the uh, Saturdays during the school year. You were telling me that uh, you've been doing this for a while now, uh, but but what really is important to you uh, is uh, their success. You know, not just starting something and then just letting it go, but really being an active force involved in, in it and in, in terms of training these young people, which is vitally important. STEM, uh, in particular, is something that uh, you hear a lot of, of uh, folks talk about. You hear a lot of political folks talking about this because these are th- th- this is where it's all going. Beverly Robinson uh, is, is very famous for talking about STEM. Get your kids in a STEM program. How long have you had your STEM program, and, and, and what are your expectations from it? Um, well, we, we developed the STEM program because we believe the STEM is a part of the business. If you can develop a, a product through the science, um, through the science part of this, or the engineering part of it, or the mathematical part of it, you can actually create a job for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and that's where the business part comes in. At if you're creating something, then you should be able to own the rights to that property and be able to make money from it. You know, start your own chip business. Start your own. Um, what I mean by microchip. Um, you know, develop, you know, develop your ideas and you can be profit from that. Like you, you see a lot of kids with YouTube pages and things like that. Well, a lot of these kids can start these jobs in, in STEM and things like that. These are very profitable things. Uh, the, um, just last weekend, they had a Lego conference here. Right. Uh, they were designing these huge art pieces of artwork um, out of Lego. Um, so we've been doing, we, we, inter- we introduced that part uh, to bring that back to what you asked me, Chip, about five years ago, uh, maybe six now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we brought that in because we thought that was an important piece uh, because it added another dimension 
on to teaching kids about business and how to make that profitable. Yeah, that that seems to be, you know, really where, where, where the future is. Uh, I, I take it uh, in your programs, uh, Kelly, uh, you also challenge these young people. I mean, you, t- <laughs> you, you kind of walked us through uh, the STEM aspect of it and what they can do and what they can expect. But if they're going to be in programs like this, uh, you need to challenge them to finish what they start. And I know that that's a big thing for you. Talk a little bit about that. Well, because when when you when we we also we also teach them chess as well, um, which teaches them cognitive thinking, and it teaches them the discipline uh, to stay focused and to stay on task. And it's not easy. Um, if you ever put together a Lego system not just something you're putting blocks together. Like for example, um, we, a couple of weeks ago, we created a um, some buildings with min, the, the magnets uh, part of that. And some of the kids were a little frustrated because they couldn't connect the dots with it, right? Mm-hmm. So we have to go back to the, the basis of it and look at the pieces, how they fit together, um, you know, and how they all work together because you're taking those simple pieces of, of plastic and manipulating the shape of them. Uh, and that takes a lot of thought and process and patience as well. So you have to see it all the way through. If you're just joining us, we're speaking with Kelly Price. And, uh, you know, Kelly has been, you know, you know, on the battlefield for a long time, uh, you know, with, with these folks and creating these programs. Now, you also, did you did you create the uh, the, the, uh, the social networking program, uh, yeah, not program, but uh, events uh, going on in this city. Did I did I see that somewhere? Read that. Yeah, wasn't that you? Uh, 2000, uh, about 2009, 2010, we uh, a friend of mine in Atlanta, we created um, a way for business to, to get together uh, and kind of communicate to work together. Um, and we did that until up till COVID. Uh, we just haven't brought it back, but we are working on bringing it back since COVID went away. Um, so it, it's just a way for small businesses and different companies to get together and learn from each other. Uh, because if you inspire more entrepreneurs, what happens is they teach each other how to do business with each other. Um, and that's the best thing. By me just patronizing you, Chip, does not help me really grow your business. Not that one day. It has to be an exchange of ideas and goods as well. It was pretty popular before COVID hit. I, I, I remember that. I used to get in, in, invitations from you guys all the time about this. It was pretty popular. But this whole idea of networking, getting together, and, and what I like about that in particular is that, you know, we're not, we're not uh, you know, fighting each other. You know, we're not against no. each other. This is a true get-together, you know, of professionals to talk about shared interest, interest and, and uh, maybe create ideas that spawn from uh, from activities like this, correct? Well, that and also, I'll tell you, Skip, you can also, Chip, you can also learn from each other. Yeah. Because the same problem that I'm having in my business, you may be having that same problem. And it's not about the competition. It's about solving a problem. And how, if you're doing, if you're having some great business practices at your business, I'm sharing it with you. Because... Why not? There's a lot of people in this in this town. We can we can all make money. But you said it's it's better if we build our own resources and build ourselves together. Well, listen, my friend. Uh, before I let you go, I just want one final thing. I want I want to I want to get back to the young people. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, we we've seen a lot of incidents uh, these days uh, uh, that uh, involve our, our young people as, as young as 12, 13, 14 years old. How do we turn it around, Kelly? In your in your opinion. Um, the short answer to that, uh, Chip, is that we have to start investing in our young people. Yeah. There's organizations, uh, National Society of Black Engineers, Junior. Um, you know, there's all these great organizations that we can get our kids involved in. But we have to start setting the narrative and giving them a path. Right now, there's no path for these children. Now, some kids do have a path. Don't get me wrong, Chip. Mm-hmm. Not all of them are out doing things. But on the large scale in our city, the large part of that is we have kids that have nothing to do. And people talk about fixing a problem, but it takes work to fix this problem. Get your kids involved in something. Well, I tell you what, my friend, uh, I wanted to end on that because I knew you had something positive to say about it. But listen, I, I, I really am I'm proud of your efforts and, and, and what you're doing uh, to make our community uh, truly better out here. 
And, and I wish you uh, the best of luck in, in, in your endeavors down the road. You got a lot of fans down here on the Facebook Live line. I see Jet 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 is with you, and and, and <laughs> you know and he, he's checking you out as well. So I'm sure you guys will chop it up a little bit later. But man, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you. You're welcome back anytime, Kelly. I appreciate it, Chip. Thanks a lot. Have a great night, man. Thank you so much. All right, ladies. Gym. All right, ladies. Huh? Oh, I'll right. see you in the gym. Okay, sounds good. I see you in the gym. Absolutely there, yeah. Uh, well, that's a great way to end the show, uh, for sure. Kelly is a big, you, I mean, you see him in the gym. This guy, man, he can lift the building. So <laughs> this guy is so big and muscular. But anyway, a uh, great show tonight uh, with all my guests. I want to thank all of my guests for, for being here and chiming in uh, this evening. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just I always have to remind and I always have to plug uh, Nicole, one of my gang, one of my crew here, Nicole Covington, has her own show here on WYXR. It is on Saturday nights at midnight to 1 a.m. It is called Planet Chrome. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm proud of you. It's a really good show. It's a good show. You coming into your thing. You're doing your thing. They're going to push me out after a while, ladies and gentlemen. She and, she and Lola both, you know, they, they both have, Lola has satellite radio shows on. And, of course, Nicole is here. And, uh, you know, Brent and I are just kind of sitting over in the corner just kind of watching things. But, <laughs> but as he plays us out, uh, thank you for tuning in, checking us out, listening, uh, watching, however you find us. Uh, my brother, Michael Washington, all the way from Los Angeles, California, he's checking us out. Jay, GKP Worth is watching us. Audrey Hill and uh, my guy, Tamara Rose, Marcella Dickerson. Hi, I see you. Jackson Baker, the Honorable Jackson Baker, checking us out, as is Wilma Pegg, uh, Vicki Goldman, Bishop Charles Rogers, and the list goes on and on and on. Thank you guys so much for your support and encouragement. And if you like what we do, tell somebody and come back to Real Talk Memphis. So, for Lola, for Nicole, for Brent, I'm Chip. We're out. Have a wonderful week. Be safe. It's Real Talk.